Bible said, amen. In the Trustmark studio, the one and only governor of the great state of Mississippi, Tate Reeves. Good morning, sir. What a morning. Good morning, Paul. It has been a, it's not even nine o'clock here in, in Jackson, Mississippi, and um, Gosh. lots of things going on in the world. And, Unbelievable. And most importantly, Paul, it's a beautiful day in Mississippi. It's great to walk outside and be in the 50s, oh. and, um, and we're going to have great sunshine for uh, the next week, and um, low temperatures in the morning, and and very comfortable te- temperatures during the day. It's a great, great day to live in Mississippi. You know, I have, because we had everything going on, I didn't mention this, and I, if you don't mind, I, I just uh, mentioned that the election yesterday, uh, Jackson Councilman DeKinther Stamps is headed to the state legislature. He'll be in the House District 66. He won yesterday. In District f- uh, uh, Senate District 39, uh, Jason Barrett defeated businessman Bill Soans, uh, according to, is that what you've heard? Because... They had a couple of uh, boxes still out, but Jason Barrett is the new senator-elect there. In Senate District 15 in Starkville, businessman Bart Williams beat Joyce Meek Yates. And in House District 37 in North Mississippi, former school superintendent Lynn Wright beat David Chisholm by around 600 votes. So that's the outcome of yesterday. Well, the the one thing that I would point out is that we yeah. had four elections yesterday, and they were uh, conducted, and they were done in a safe and responsible way, and we had a very good turnout uh, in Did all we? four of those good. elections, and so I think that's uh, that speaks to the quality of the candidates, and, and I've had the opportunity to speak to several of them over the last uh, 24 hours and congratulate the, the winners. We had good people running, and um, and I'm hopeful that uh, that, that they do a good job serving uh, their constituents. Let me let me ask you this. We're talking about the weather, uh, the aftermath of uh, of Delta, the hurricane. Anything, any thoughts on that? Well, again, for the most part, Mississippi was spared major damage. Uh, we, we saw with Hurricane Laura and then Hurricane Sally, mm-hmm. uh, one tick to the west at the last minute, one tick to the east yeah. at the last minute, and Hurricane Delta stayed west and and sort of took the same path that hurricane laura took uh entered the the um gulf uh, of mexico and when 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 the storms get in the gulf of mexico they're really difficult to determine exactly where they're going to go because the fact is paul it's just really not that far from the texas louisiana line Mm. to the alabama florida line and so uh you've got to prepare for the worst and pray for the best and expect somewhere in between and 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 look i will tell you one of the one of the reasons of very, very many reasons, but one of the reasons we are fortunate in Mississippi is because we have a, an emergency management team uh, at the state and the local level and our partners at the federal level that are just top notch. They know what they're doing. Uh, these emergency management uh, officials in, in our coastal counties particularly, but throughout our state, are just fantastic. And I've, it's been my yeah. privilege to work with them through COVID, but also through hurricane season. And hopefully we won't have any more hurricanes in the Gulf in 2020. I think we've had enough unrest. And you think that's okay if we just kind of calm down here for a day or two? If we could just put 2020 on in, in fast speed and get to 2021, <laughs> not that it's going to be any better, but you I know it's got moving fast it. enough. Just yeah. slow down. Slow, slow let, your roll. Let's do talk about this as far as COVID's concerned and uh, the uptick. I think we had 713 new cases yesterday. 128 of those new cases were in long-term care facilities and the additional deaths attributed to the virus, 14. So we're at 105,941. I think deaths are 3,115. And as we heard from uh, the mayor at Vicksburg, they've got it under control pretty well there. There are some hot spots out there. But you're, when, uh, when you're addressing the people this morning uh, on this Wednesday, October the 14th, as far as the mask and everything else, what's your thoughts? Well, um, first of all, it's losing one Mississippian uh, to a, v- a virus uh, that was released by uh, or out of China is certainly um, something that Ely and I pray about. We pray for the families, and it's it's horrible uh, that so many Mississippians have been affected by this. Um, having said that, uh, Paul, we've got to think back to where we were in, in early March, and, and from the very beginning, we've made it very clear that in Mississippi, our goal is not to eradicate the virus or eliminate the virus because we don't believe that that is a realistic goal. Our goal in our state has been since the beginning Mm -hmm. is to ensure that every single Mississippian that can get better with quality care receives that quality care. It's the reason the people of Mississippi have heard me talk about the integrity of the health care system. When we look at 
uh, numbers every day. We certainly look at the daily new cases. That's an important number. But the, the numbers that are, that are really important are total hospitalizations, total number of patients that are in ICU beds, and, and total number of patients on ventilators. Think back to March. The whole conversation was around ventilators. ventilators yeah. Would we have enough ventilators in America uh, to deal with this virus? And the fact is, in Mississippi, uh, we have uh, almost 700 ventilators, and yesterday we had 69 patients on ventilators in Mississippi. And so um, the, the fact is our healthcare system is, is stressed as it is every single day, it seems, across uh, across the state with or without the coronavirus. But we're in a far better position today than we were uh, even through late July and early August. What are some of the things that you would like to see done as far as the, the, the distribution of this money? Are we on tap for that as far as getting that money out? Or do we? Where are we with that? Well, the the legislature has uh, enacted uh, multiple laws, multiple programs that are being um, administered throughout state government. And the the good news is that uh, once each of the programs are completed um, and it fully administered, uh, the money will go back into the unemployment trust mm-hmm. fund. It has been my goal from the beginning to make sure that small business taxes do not go up. Uh, our unemployment trust fund was one of the three or four most healthy trust funds in America prior to uh, this pandemic. We had over $700 million uh, in that trust fund. That was protection against future tax increases on small businesses. Yeah. It's the reason that we made sure that, that that fund had as much money in it did, just as the same uh, concept is the reason we had $550 million in our rainy day fund, working with former Governor Bryant and and other leaders, we, we were very fiscally responsible for the last eight years. We put money in those areas to protect against future tax increases. And it is true in Mississippi and it's true across the country. These trust funds have been stressed. Uh, we've spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in local in, in state dollars to to deal with the spike in unemployment that occurred in March or April. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you, Paul, the, the legislature put $181 million uh, in the trust fund. We asked for $500 million, but we think we're going to get a very healthy balance uh, uh, able at the end of this to transfer over there, uh, hopefully to mitigate any future tax increases. Let's talk about the, the, the Hines County Chancery Court uh, ruled uh, against you as, as far as the partial veto of the House bill uh, earlier this year. Where does that stand now? Uh, well, that was not a surprise at all, Paul. This is a local um, judge in Hines County, mm-hmm. uh, and we never anticipated that, that the, this particular judge would, would make any other decision. This is a decision that the, the Mississippi Supreme Court is going to make. The Constitution, in my opinion, is very clear. It gives the the governor the ability to line item veto, and it's for a particular reason um, that the, that our framers put that in the Constitution, and that is that um, we, we want to make sure that, that there is a check and a balance. And um, so that is currently going before the Mississippi Supreme Court. It has been appealed, uh, as was always anticipated. Whoever won at the lower court level, the other side was going to appeal, and that's what has occurred. Uh, the attorney general, uh, which is an interesting point, the attorney general is representing uh, the governor in this mm-hmm. case, uh, which is very different than the last two cases that, <laughs> that dealt with the line item veto in which yeah. the Democrat attorney general represented the Democrat legislature against first Governor Ford Ice and then Governor Barber. So, you know, it's a it's a, a case that needs to be settled, and, and I'm confident in our is position. Is there a timetable for that before the end of the year? Or just... They have set a timetable. The, the Chief Justice, I presume, or, or whomever wrote the order, wrote an order in the last week or so to to lay out an expedited time frame, and so yeah. sometime over the next six weeks, I think they'll have li- oral arguments and all those so things. So the monies involved in that dispute, are they on hold, or does it affect any of that? No, they are currently on hold. The the the, the folks that are suing me over this line item veto agreed to mm-hmm. uh, for those to be on hold until the Supreme Court rules. So we're our, our attorneys are working together, and, and we'll see what the Supreme Court Let's says. Let's jump into medical marijuana when we get back. be great. So to speak. <laughs> back with the governor next. Notice this, that Michael Heron, another attorney, this guy's out of uh, Batesville, is suing all of uh, all 59 COVID-19 executive orders issued by the governor declared unconstitutional on one part, and you got somebody on the other one saying we do need the mask, and somebody says we can't do the mask, so it is a damn if you do, damn if you don't. Well, there's no, there's no doubt that everyone has an opinion in 2020 as to uh, the right direction to take. And, and, Paul, what I'll tell you is there are a lot of well-intentioned people in Mississippi that have different opinions on 
on lots of the different things that, that we have done and tried to mitigate mm-hmm. the spread of this virus. What I will tell you is I wake up every day uh, knowing that um, that if I do what I believe is right for the people that that um, that I've done, um, I've uh, withheld my responsibility. And, and I think where we find ourselves is, is in a position in which we have significantly reduced uh, the number of cases, the spread of the virus, uh, hospitalizations are way down. Uh, ICU patients are way down. We peaked at 337 ICU patients, and it's about half of that today. And so we, we, we're continuing to work through it. Um, what do you think the spike is uh, uh, attributed to? Well, first of all, I wouldn't characterize it as a spike. It has been a slight uptick. Mm-hmm. We we went from 9,300 cases at our peak the last week of July uh, down to about 3,200. And over the last five weeks or so, uh, we've seen a, a relatively constant, relatively slight and modest rise. Um, we've been between 3,200 and about 4,000 cases over the last four weeks. And and we're continuing to see uh, what this week will hold. We had um, uh, uh, yesterday we did have 700 cases, but you'll recall last Tuesday we had over yeah. we had about a thousand cases because we had a data dump, and so we're seeing a slight uptick. Uh, I think people are doing more. Um, I think we're seeing a little less participation. Look, um, the the question to me is is not whether you should uh, mitigate and whether you should exercise constraints. I absolutely believe that people should wear masks when indoors. I believe that people should maintain social distancing and stay at least six feet apart. And I believe that we should minimize groups and the size of groups. Uh, But I think Mississippians are smart and capable enough to doing that without the heavy hand of government telling you that you must do it. And so uh, I'm asking people and encouraging people, and I've seen uh, the president and the vice president both uh, within the last couple of weeks uh, wearing a mask. And and, and it's, it's just the right thing to do. But by the same token, Paul, one of the more frustrating things to me throughout this is this notion of mask shaming. We want to shame people who wear masks, and the others want to shame people who don't. The reality is that w- we need to talk to each other and, and think what is best for ourselves and what is best for our neighbors, and I believe that uh, the best way in which to protect ourselves is for everyone to exercise personal responsibility, and if you're going to go indoors and be in a, a large crowd, uh, wear a mask. Stay so- socially it's distanced. Most like, much like the political ideology, we've chosen sides, and the other side is wrong, uh, a mask or not to mask, but then the World Health Organization the other day, well, yesterday, before yesterday, comes out with this this revelation that people in close contact and, and being confined is is a bad deal. So we've gotten so many so many back and forths on this. We we just lost trust in most of that. I got to ask you this before we get to the medical marijuana. You've nominated two people to fill the vacancies of the State Board of Education. You want to speak to that? Well, two highly competent, highly capable individuals that I believe will add value to the State Board of Education. Mm-hmm. They come highly recommended. Um, they understand public education. Uh, and they also uh, they also are going to focus on what I have said for many years, and that is if you can ensure that the adults that are making decisions around public education are focused on doing what's best for kids rather than doing what's best for the adults, then they will make the right decision yep. virtually every single time. I have full confidence in both of these individuals. They're going to do what's best for kids, and, and, and it may the, the, the education status quo may like it, they may not, but they're going to make decisions that are best for kids, and, and I think they'll be great compliments to Dr. Jason Dean, who is the chairman, mm-hmm. who's done a fantastic job, someone I appointed uh, years ago to the board. And um, and so I'm I'm excited about the future of public they education are in Mississippi. Angela Bass of Jackson and Glenn East of Gulfport. Uh, Angela is nominated for the seat reserved for somebody from the state central Supreme Court district. She's executive director of the Mississippi Early Learning Alliance. Bass studied education policy and management at Harvard Graduate School of Education. I heard of that. She taught in Tunica, DeSoto County Schools, and worked as an administrator at a charter school and a KIPP school in uh, Memphis Collegiate High. And East is nominated for a school. He's a school administrator. He's superintendent of the Gulfport School District, which has 10 schools and about 5,800 students, so two good people there. Medical marijuana, your thoughts? Well, um, first of all, I think when you look at Initiative 65, uh, the there, there are some very well-intentioned individuals that are involved in that particular initiative, um, but I, I personally believe that our Constitution uh, is not a place where you should put uh, medical marijuana, and so um, I think that there's a, 
There's certainly an argument to be made to allow for uh, specific uses of, of this drug or any other drug for medicinal purposes. The question is, is the way in which 65 worded, is that the way to do it? So, for instance, um, do you believe that if we have uh, marijuana al allowable in our state, that there should be a means by which to tax it, such that, for instance, just like alcohol, mm -hmm. there are those who think we shouldn't have alcohol, there are those who think we should, but everyone generally agrees that if we're going to have it, that $125 million a year to well, the general go, fund is a good when thing. When you go in and make a 65 purchase, 65 doesn't though, allow that. When you go in to make a purchase, you will be taxed on it, it be, but the taxes will not, you won't be taxed on it? There, There is a, as I appreciate it, uh, there is a, there. you will be taxed on it, but 100% of those proceeds will not go to the state general fund. They'll go to the right. state department of health. Well, to administer but here's the, question. the marijuana what program. What does that mean to administer the marijuana program? I mean, we're not going to build their bricks and mortar, so we're not buying their inventory. So what the hell is that money you going to be used for? It's a great question, Paul. I, I can't answer that. Um, and, so and that's one of we the could problems have millions upon millions initial... of dollars sitting there we don't know what to do with, other well, than expand the Department of Health. Well, I, 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 well, and I don't think the Department of Health is going to have the – uh, ability to really expand itself to do some of the other missions that they have because it's unique. It must be spent uniquely on the marijuana industry. That's the reason the State Board of Health has come out in opposition mm -hmm. uh, to Initiative 65, even though they're going to see a windfall of dollars. By the way, that's a that we should talk a little bit about that because I think that's pretty significant. And and I've worked very closely with the individuals at the Department of Health, and they have done a fantastic job through COVID. Um, but when a state agency that is potentially going to get uh, significant additional dollars comes out against that process, um, that ought to tell you something because there aren't very many state agencies that don't want more money to spend if you've ever uh, watched the legislative process in, in Jackson. But just putting this into practice is is a mammoth job. Have they even begun to do that? They haven't started to do that. I mean, I'm talking about from the rules and regulations that they're they are able to do, and some of those rules and regulations are already written within the confines of the initiative. They don't have a choice. They've just got to implement what the legal drug dealers said they must because there's not a lot, a lot of flexibility there. Well, have, have they begun to put a structure together because there is also a timeline? And I can I can honestly answer, Paul, and tell you that I have no idea if they've started to do that. Uh, because if an Initiative 65 is very clever in that the governor has no role in the administration of this program. The governor nor does has, any other elected official. Uh, nor does any other elected official. And and that's where you're looking at a lot of people now that are in favor of medical marijuana because there, there is a way in which to do it uh, that are opposed to Initiative 65 because they don't want to look up and having um, marijuana dispensers or marijuana buildings uh, in every small town across the state, and that is no. certainly a realistic possibility uh, if 65 uh, are Are passes. you to the point where you are acquiescing to the fact that if 65A passes, there's a possibility, or if, it, if both of them fail, to at least look at it in the next session, how we can do this on a more coordinated basis? Well, if 65A were to be selected, it is, it's mandated it's that it will yeah, be dealt with. part it of the will, Constitution. It, it will, so. 65A, it will be dealt with uh, in the next legislative session. There yeah. will be a role to play. Everyone will have uh, their ability to, to decide exactly what they want it to look like. So I think yeah. if you're for medical marijuana, you should vote um, 65 for a. 65A. It is a better way to do it. I'm trying to brand that. Uh, I like listen, that. Listen, let me ask you this one more uh, one more question before we let you go. Any changes as far as Medicaid expansion is what's the talk out there? Because when we first started this, we knew that it was almost unaffordable. And, and some things have changed one way or the other. I'm not sure what the mechanism is in Washington as far as the payback and everything else. Where are we as far as that? Because that's going to be coming up, too. I continue to be opposed to Obamacare expansion in Mississippi. They've had multiple hearings in the Capitol the last couple of days, a lot of providers talking about increased provider fees. And if yeah. the legislature wants to uh, spend more money, then, then they certainly uh, can do that through the Medicaid tech appropriation bill. But all of those things cost money, yeah. uh, which takes it away from public education and public safety and other September numbers. Things. September numbers look pretty good. Revenues are doing very well in Mississippi. Our economy is going to roar back. I am very optimistic about Maybe our future. Maybe they look a lot better than New York because we didn't just completely shut down. The vast majority <laughs> of Mississippi's economy has been humming since day one. And kudos to you for that good decision. 
Governor, thank you, sir. Appreciate it very much. Thank you, Paul. Always a pleasure. Look forward to coming back. We got sound.